Is this working? Yes. You can hear me? Hello. Hello, Moldova. Thank you. Um, as mentioned, I work on a team at CNN in New York that uh, tracks misinformation online, uh, trolls, bots, um, and fake news. So as you can imagine, uh, we've been pretty busy these days. Um, is everybody here familiar with the black, ooh, we've gone a little bit ahead here. Everybody here is familiar with the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. It sprang up in about 2014 after the shooting dead of an black, unarmed black man uh, by police in uh, Ferguson, Missouri. Um, it's one of the most active uh, social uh, groups in the United States. and like activists all around the world that relies on platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and Instagram to organize, to spread its message and to recruit new members. Um, I'm going to show you three of the most popular Black Lives Matter pages um, on Facebook. Uh, this first one, as you can see, it's got a huge audience. It has almost 700,000 followers. Um, until recently, it was the biggest Black Lives Matter page on Facebook. Um, you can see it sells merchandise, it posts videos, it's got a logo. Um, the next page is Blacktivist, again, another massively popular page, 600,000 followers. As you can see, it, it posts events, um, promotes events in the US. Um, and finally, another page also called Black Lives Matter, which has a smaller audience, 300,000 followers. But again, as you can see, it's got a logo, it's posting uh, content regularly. Only one of those pages is genuine. Only one of those pages is run by real activists in the United States. In fact, only one of those pages is even run from inside the United States. Suspense. Um, the first two pages I showed you are both fake. Uh, one run from Australia, the other run from Russia. So. Why would somebody go to all the bother of creating a fake page, a fake website, logos, possibly spending hours every day um, posting and populating the page? There's normally two main motivations for that. One is financial. If you've got a big page, you can drive traffic to your website. Maybe you have ads on there, like Google Ads or ads from another platform. And two is political and ideological. So let's talk about these two fake pages. Now, they're no longer on Facebook. Um, after we found and investigated the pages and reported them and reported about them, Facebook actually removed them. So this first, this until two weeks ago, this was the most popular Black Lives Matter page on Facebook, 700,000 followers. Um, we got a tip at CNN in New York that there, this page might not be quite what it says it is, uh, quite what it seems to be. Um, and we found that hard to believe because it's such a huge audience. It's been active for almost two years. And it's the biggest page of this group on Facebook. So when we started looking into it, we found what was strange was once we started talking to Black Lives Matter activists, nobody seemed to know who was running the page. And like every activist group, you know, people talk regularly and you know, it's spread out across the United States, but people tend to know who is running what. Nobody seemed to know who was behind this page. Then once we began looking into what the page was posting, it was posting th things that you would normally expect from a Black Lives Matter group. Videos of police violence against African Americans, news stories about racial issues in the United States. But it was regularly and consistently linking to two specific websites. 
When we looked at those websites and when we looked through the domain records of who owned and operated those websites, we found that they were once registered to this guy. Um, not somebody you'd immediately think of when you think of a Black Lives Matter activist. His name is Ian McKay and he lives in Australia, the other side of the world. Um, and when we, start, we, we asked him about the page, he denied he was involved. As we dug further into the page, we found that the page was running fundraisers. So it was using platforms like PayPal, DonorBox, and it was encouraging people to donate. So on the Facebook page, up to its 700,000 followers, it was saying, donate to us, donate to the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, after CNN investigated a little more, we, speaking to some folks who were familiar with where this money was going, it turned out it was actually going to Australian bank accounts. And over $100,000 were raised. That's $100,000 that could have gone to real, and people thought they were donating to the Black Lives Matter movement, when in fact, it seems it was going to an Australian bank account and there's no sign that the money ever went into uh, the actual activist causes. Um, when we broke the story, Facebook took down the page. The, it turned out that Ian McKay, the Australian white man in his middle ages, uh, actually got fired from his role as a, as a labor union worker in Australia. So it's clear there that the motivations to run that fake page were for profit. You know, there was two ways of making money there. One was through the fundraisers, of which they raised at least 100,000 American dollars. And the other was also they had some ads on the websites they were driving people to. So they were also making money on the ads on, on, on these websites. But it's not always about profit. Um, Often it can be ideological um, or, and political. And this page, Blacktivist, which is the, was the second biggest Black Lives Matter group on Facebook, um, you could see it was promoting events. Here, this you know one event I think, which is for uh, somewhere in California. Um, again, we started looking into this page and. You know, it was posting things that you'd expect to see on pages, videos of police violence, um, events in the United States. But again, Black Lives Matter activists didn't know who ran the page. And as we started looking at the page closer, it wasn't running fundraisers like the Australian page. It wasn't asking people for money. It was just posting ideological um, content. But as we look closer, some of the phrases and terminology that was being used wasn't always clear that it was coming from a fluent English speaker. And this is one tweet. They also, most of these pages have, you know, accounts on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, Tumblr, all across the board. Um, this was one tweet that they sent. Um, there is injustice being done to black people. That's why we must speak up. Hashtag black unite. Now, everything sounds fine there, but what we noticed was the apostrophe on that. It's going a different direction. And we noticed that they were making this mistake over and over and over again. Um, and funny enough, we know that a lot of Russian keyboards, we called up our bureau in Moscow and we said, hey, can you send us a picture of the keyboard that you got at the CNN office in Moscow? We want to see, is there, what, is there an apostrophe button on it? Is there, and we found that oftentimes on Russian keyboards, there isn't that correct American apostrophe. So it turned out that this group was being run um, from St. Petersburg, Russia, by a group um, known as the Internet Research Agency, which is basically a troll group in St. Petersburg that is alleged to have ties to Vladimir Putin and the Russian government. And obviously there's been a lot of coverage about, um, you know, 
uh, the role of this troll group in American politics, particularly leading up to the 2016 uh, presidential election. In fact, some of the people who are behind this group, the Internet Research Agency, have been indicted by um, the US Justice Department. And from speaking to people from the American intelligence community, they said that they were aware, and I'm sure many people in, in this room who are from this region are aware of these type of misinformation campaigns or fake pages. And the US intelligence community from their work in this part of the world were also very aware of it. But they didn't think that it would work in America. They didn't think that the American population would be able to be fooled and tricked in this way. And it turned out they were very wrong. Um, and a, what the Internet Research Agency, this troll group, uh, weren't just running pages about Black Lives Matter, they were running pages and accounts about every, pretty much every divisive issue in American life. LGBT rights, black rights as we mentioned, targeting gun owners, targeting um, US patriotism, every single topic. And, in one case, in May 2016, they used two different Facebook pages to actually organize a real protest in Houston, Texas. And they used two pages, a pro-Muslim page and an anti-Muslim page, to encourage people to come out and, and, and basically demonstrate against one another. And it worked. People showed up. This is a picture. May 20th, 2016, on one side of the street are uh, nationalist, anti-Muslim uh, folks, and on the other side are pro-Muslim activists. So this was a pretty successful campaign. They had thousands of pages. It took the US government and investigative reporters and um, many others a very long time to figure all this out. But of course, not all trolls are Russian, not all fake news comes from Russia. Um, and one of the most popular stories uh, in the week, in the lead up to the 2016 US presidential election was this story. FBI agents suspected in Hillary email leaks found dead in apparent murder-suicide. It was published on a website called the Denver Guardian and it was got more than half a million interactions on Facebook um, around the time of the election. That's a huge amount of interactions on the platform. That's basically made it one of the most popular shared and interacted with stories on Facebook around the time of the election. And the story was totally made up. Not an ounce of truth. The whole website is fake. And it's run. Ah, I had a picture of the guy, but uh, it's, it's not in this. It's run by a guy not in Russia, um, not a Putin-backed troll, but a guy who lives near the beach in California, in the United States. Um, and the reason he did that was to make money. He said he didn't particularly care about Donald Trump. He didn't particularly care about Hillary Clinton. He just knew that if he made up a fake story, had his ads on the Denver Guardian, that people would click and share the story, and with every click, he would make a little bit of money. So, there, as you can see, there's multiple motivations for creating what is known as fake news, disinformation, misinformation, whatever you want to call it. Um, political, ideological, and financial. And sometimes it's a combination of both. And very often, particularly in the United States, because the political, um, political scene there at the moment is so polarized that people see stories like the Denver Guardian and they want to believe it. And they share it. So what can be done? <laughs> Uh, the platforms, Facebook and Twitter, are trying to now take steps in light of, you know, the Russian trolls and Cambridge Analytica scandal to 
have make it more difficult for people who are creating and pushing fake news to operate on their platforms. Um, also, the US Congress is considering new laws around political advertising and transparency on who is behind these pages and websites. Um, but it's a very difficult thing to stop. I mean, it's so easy to create a website, it's so easy to create a page, and you know, the right combination of headline and eye-catching image, you can make it go viral pretty quickly. Um, but I guess to end on a more positive note, um, you know, this whole conversation, the fact that particularly over the past two years that, you know, there's particularly more so in the West, I mean, I know in the United States and Western Europe, this is people, it's a new phenomenon, I guess, that people are now dealing with, that they have been tricked by fake news. Um, but the conversation that's taking place and the awareness that's being raised about whether it's your personal data or maybe thinking twice before you share a story online um, is a positive thing and uh, hopefully something that will lead to uh, the cracking down on the spread of misinformation. Thank you very much. Um, if anyone has a question, please come to the front, but I have one first. Um, of course, we, uh, you know, I, I work in media, so, so I, I'm very much uh, uh, concerned about all of this, and of course I think about it every day, and one of the biggest questions I have is, who should be responsible for all of this? Should we uh, tell Facebook and Twitter that they are responsible for what they have on their website or should we tell you know, our justice system that they have to get involved and if they do get involved, when, is, when does it start being an issue of uh, you know, invading the you know, freedom of speech and, and, and such? Who do you think is responsible for making sure that this stuff doesn't happen? That's a very good question and it's one that people are trying to figure out. I think the answer is responsibility lies of all parties. You know, the tech platforms obviously got to do more to crack down on this stuff. You know, if there's a page, if they see a page being run from Australia that's supposed to be an American activist, they should think twice. Uh, you know, they should look into that. Um, you're right, you know, governments can do more by bringing in possibly laws on, you know, transparency around who's posting what, but there's obviously you don't want that to go too far because that could impact on civil liberties. But finally, I think. Um, tech literacy and just literacy in general uh, for people to think more critically of what they see online. Um, you know, when they see a post to consider where is that coming from? Where, what is the Denver Guardian? I've never heard of it before. Why should I believe this story that's on this website? So it's a combination, I think, of all parties, but certainly there's a lot of personal responsibility there. The, the tech literacy that you're mentioning, uh, this also involves a lot of critical thinking. But you know, people get smartphones and tablets at seven, eight years old, and uh, they become interested in, in news and funny stuff at like 10 these days. So uh, would that work? I mean, should we talk to our children from age, starting with, with 10 years old, that you don't share anything online? I mean, I think the problem extends just beyond social media, right, in the online space. It's what you said, it's about to teach critical thinking. Um, I know when I was, I'm from Ireland, as you might have picked up from the accent, um, but I mean, when I was in school, when we were taught civics or politics, it was about saying, this is the president, this is the prime minister, this is where the president lives. They never taught us in class about, you know, sometimes in politics, politicians lie. Sometimes in political campaigns, you shouldn't believe everything that the campaign is saying. So I think it's, it's, it's a wider problem across, you know, all countries, and I know certainly in the United States, of thinking people, uh, teaching people to think more critically of they, everything they see, whether it's in a newspaper, on television, or online. Does anyone have a good question? <laughs> Uh, so how much of the problem with fake news do you think is actually people uh, get hearing something that they want to believe is true uh, versus, you know, 
Russia or somebody trying to make money, they're just give, being given you know, whatever they believe. They believe Hillary would do something like this, and therefore the story works. You're totally right. I mean, it's a complicated ecosystem of it can happen that a troll, uh, you know, the Denver Guardian, for instance, that guy made up that story and then maybe some Russian trolls pushed it because it pushed their ideological, back their ideological position. But also then, you know, some people in the United States wanted to believe that, so share that anyway. Um, it's, it's, it's a problem. What are you think? What are its? I guess your question was, you know, what percentage is coming from where? It's very difficult to say. Um, just as that story was created by an American for financial purposes, many people then shared it for their political purposes. Whereas oftentimes something can be created for political purposes and then shared for pin financial purposes. So it's a complicated and messy ecosystem. Yeah. So a slight follow-up. How can a tech platform you mentioned should probably do a little bit more work for filtering this, but the, it's not just them filtering things that are f completely fake. I mean, you, you can't have Google or Facebook be the final arbitrator of truth. Um, what, at what point do we draw the line between letting people post things that are biased, maybe not fake, but you know, a little step beyond the truth, a little bit more inflammatory than mm. what is would be perfect media. Uh, uh, I don't it's a good question. What's the level of fake we accept? <laughs> um, I don't have the answer for that. Uh, you know, I think there's objectively fake stories, like that Denver Guardian article, for instance. That guy told us he totally made it up. It wasn't reported anywhere else. There's not a grain of truth in there. It gets obviously far more difficult when there are said hyperpartisan stories that people share within their own echo chambers, um, and that is a huge, huge challenge. And I think there has to be a massive conversation about how um, should that be policed, or is there anything the platforms can do about that? Um, and I think we're starting that discussion now. But after Cambridge Analytica, after these Russian trolls, I think we're only now beginning to scratch the surface of of how we how we deal with that. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny. Bye.